Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody. Today we are going to talk about uh, skin tissue engineering. So before uh, going into the skin tissue engineering or uh, tissue engineered graft, we should need to know about uh, the function of the skin. So uh, as we all know that uh, skin is the largest organ of the body and uh, mainly it does that uh, protection from the environment, especially abrasion and uh, fluid loss. Then uh, we have uh, uh, that gives the containment for the body structure and also the organs present inside the body. It also involves in the heat regulation like uh, in the form of sweat, dilation, contraction and blood vessels. Uh, it also involves in the sensation of uh, nerves like while we touch uh, the conduction of the things will be passing into and uh, will be sensed. And it also involves in the synthesis and uh, storage of vitamin D. Further, uh, it also acts as a blood reservoir. So, it also plays an important role in uh, excreting the unwanted substances through sweat. So, uh, before uh, developing any skin graft or something, we need to know about that anatomy of the skin. So, uh, if we see the skin, so uh, it has two layers, first layer is dermis and the second top layer is epidermis. So, uh, on the bottom layer is not of the part of the skin, but it also plays a uh, role uh, while we discuss about the skin. So, that uh, bottom layer is uh, subcutaneous tissue or uh, it is called as uh, hypodermis. So, it, uh, it has uh, many parts. Uh, so, uh, attached with the hair follicles, we have sebaceous gland. So, sebaceous gland produces sebum. So, that sebum is giving lubrication for that hair, hair follicle and also this is responsible for uh, making that waterproof for the skin and it also acts as a primary defense system. Then attached to that uh, sebaceous gland, we have erector pili muscle. That uh, erector pili muscle that is responsible for that uh, pulling of hair. When uh, goosebumps happens, that uh, pulling of hair happens because of that uh, muscle and we have the nerve conducts. So, this is responsible for uh, the sensation uh, sensation, and we have blood vessels for uh, transport of nutrients and other things from uh, subcutaneous part to dermis and further dermis to epidermis part. So, we have uh, epidermis. So, epidermis have uh, various layers. So, if you see the first layer is uh, epithelial cells. So, this so, the uh, this first layer contains epithelial cells and this is called uh, stratum basal. Then because of the blood vessels whatever is coming from the dermis part, it, the blood supply is going into the epidermis and the cells will be keep dividing. So, the division of the cells goes in the top uh, portion. Then from the basal that goes into that uh, uh, next layer that is called stratum spinosum. In sp stratum spinosum, the epithelial cells gets keratinized and apart from that keratinocytes, we have uh, melanocytes which are uh, responsible for the color of the skin and the next layer of that uh, stratum spinosum is stratum uh, granulosum. Then uh, here uh, the cells flattening happens and over there we have stratum corneum that is the final layer of that epidermis and where uh, that acts as the shed of that old cells. So, we have in between layer epidermis and dermis is that junction epidermal dermal junction. This is called reet ridges. So, this reet ridges plays a main role in uh, giving mechanical strength to the epidermis and it also gives adherence to the dermis and epidermis because of this uh, epidermal junction. Apart from that, the soluble molecules whatever is present in the dermal, dermis the transfer of soluble molecules from dermis to epidermis is happening through this junction. So, uh, when there is a uh, wound in uh, normal skin, what happens is by innate mechanism, the 
wound will get healed. So, uh, it, invo it involves series of steps. The first step is hemostasis. In hemostasis, what happens is the blood coagulation will occur. In the blood coagulation, uh, during the blood coagulation uh, happen, at the wound side, epinephrine will be released and that uh, epinephrine, once that epinephrine is released, that platelets coagulation will start and like uh, the complete process is called uh, hemostasis. Then the next step uh, next to hemostasis is inflammation. So, once the blood started uh, coagulating, uh, the swelling and uh, other things will happen because of the inflammation. During swelling, it also produces heat and uh, flu fluid flow also will be more and obviously the pain also will be getting. Then uh, here in uh, we have uh, the defense system also will play an important role. When there is a wound, the foreign particles will try to invade into the body. So, that time that leukocytes and macrophages will start developed into that uh, particular site. So, the first, uh, first site of mechanism is by leukocytes. So, uh, that leukos leukocytes will be replaced by the ma macrophages. So, that macrophages what it does is it will clean that uh, debris of the wound. Then the next step is proliferation. So, proliferation is mainly of uh, that fibroblast whatever uh, whatever is involved in that uh, dermis. So, if that wound is happening only with the epidermis part that uh, proliferation will happen with the help of uh, keratinocytes. So, uh, this involves three different uh, types or like uh, classification the first uh, first one is granulation in the granulation what happens is the cells will start uh, dividing. If we, uh, if we take fibroblast or uh, dermis as the wound site, so the fibroblast will start doubling and it will be creating uh, multiple cells and after that once that uh, cells start dividing obviously the size of the things will come down and it will contraction will happen then epithelialization will happen. The next step is remodeling, in the remodeling what happens is that fibroblasts will develop a extracellular matrix, uh, that extracellular matrix contains collagen fibril, proteoglycans and other fibronectins. So, uh, fibroblast initially will produce that pro collagen, that pro collagen will twist together and that form uh, a strong collagen. So, many collagen uh, molecules will come together and they form a very strong network. So, because of this network only uh, we get the fresh or uh, regenerated tissue. So, if this uh, <coughs> collagen is not twisted and it is not forming proper network, what happens will be like uh, that skin tissue will not, that mechanical strength of the tissue whatever is formed will not be equivalent to the normal skin. So, if we get a wound, we ourselves will be able to see such kind of difference. So, when that uh, tissue starts forming, that strength of the tissue will be very uh, smooth. So, once that new tissue is formed, we will be able to see that uh, strength of the tissue will be equivalent to the earlier tissue. So, this, this is what happening, the reason is that uh, collagen remodeling, that is what happens at that side. So, uh, <coughs> this is normal mechanism of uh, wound healing. So, when this normal mechanism is uh, in few conditions, this normal mechanism will not happen. So, the first mechanism is like uh, poor circulation, when there is poor circulation of blood into the wound site, that normal wound healing will not happen. And when there is a edema or uh, insufficient nutrients, that time also the normal wound healing process will not occur. Then uh, when there is a repetitive uh, trauma to the wound, in that time also uh, the wound will not get healed by its in own uh, mechanism. When there is a extensive wounding, then also that uh, wound will not heal. Then the burn lead to deep wound. If there is a deep wound, it is very difficult for that uh, wound to heal. Then the next reason could be extensive skin loss due to infection such as uh, necroticizing facilitases. Then uh, we have uh, when there is a surgery, so during surgery also we get uh, skin loss. So, that time also the, it is very difficult for that uh, skin to regenerate and wound to heal. So, the probable solution for these like when uh, there is innate mechanism is not happening, the solution could be <coughs> induced primary healing. So, induced primary healing will be like consider we have 
wound here like this. So, uh, in induced primary healing what we do is this portion and this portion will be combined together like this way and they put some stitches over here. So, that will be totally covered. So, when this is happening, we will be, we'll be able to heal, but when that uh, wound bed size is more, it is very difficult to bring that uh, both the sides of the wound and to bring that uh, down into that portion. Then the second step is uh, delayed primary healing. So, in the delayed primary healing only, uh, we will be talking about that uh, skin graft or uh, uh, tissue engineered based uh, uh, product. So, uh, in delayed primary healing what happens is, so consider uh, we have a wound like this. So, this both the skin cannot be brought together and uh, we cannot stitch it. So, for making that fibroblast to grow, we need to keep something over here. So, that will be achieved by the graft whatever uh, we are developing. So, uh, classification of skin involves uh, two uh, grafts like uh, first one is uh, split thickness graft and the second one is full thickness graft. Split thickness graft involves only the epidermis uh, regeneration full thickness graft involves the epidermis together with the dermis regeneration. So, uh, uh, nowhere that hypodermis is involved as I told in that uh, uh, anatomy part, hypodermis is not part of the skin, but it plays a role when we discuss about that uh, engineering uh, thing. We have is skin graft, we have autograft, autograft is uh, from the own patient sample, they will be taking the tissue and they will be placing it. Isograft genetically equivalent uh, sample will be taken and from the species, same species, the graft will be taken. In the xenograft, uh, from one species to other species, it will be transferred. So, uh, among this autograft is advantageous because of various reason and the sources for uh, split thickness graft could be like. Uh, stomach or thighs or uh, back side of the uh, buttocks and like uh, uh, as I told uh, that split split thickness graft involves only that epidermis part. In the epidermis part what they do is uh, they use uh, dermatome to cut that uh, splice. So, that splice will be further uh, so that splice will be further what they do is they make mesh into it and uh, they will be placing into that uh, wound site. Then uh, we have uh, sources for the full thickness graft. So, in the full thickness graft what they do is, they will uh, cut the graft from the back side of the head and uh, buttocks and also armpits from these portions they can get the full thickness graft. So, full thickness graft is like excision of that complete part of that skin. It is not like we do not need to use any dermatome or any other specialized instrument to cut that splice, whereas that uh, complete skin will be taken. So, they will be excising that uh, portion and they will be placing into that uh, place wherever uh, it is required. So, uh, when they do the surgery like after uh, cutting the portion from the particular part, what they do is uh, they will give uh, some pressure onto that uh, place and they will be placing a support like uh, this way. Uh, so, this is called a bolster. So, they will keep the bolster and they will stitch it. So, the reason for uh, doing such thing is, if you do not keep something over that uh, portion wherever that graft is placed, that will not be in that position for long time. So, for making that sure, they are uh, keeping some bolster into that play, uh, uh, surgery wherever uh, they have done and they will be covering it by stitching. So, uh, advantages of this uh, skin grafts is like uh, it is taken from the own body. So, it is uh, biocompatible and it is non-immunogenic. It also has disadvantages. So, the main disadvantage is like uh, that is taken from the own uh, body. So, obviously, it will give pain to the patient. And then another thing is it will again create secondary wound. So, that secondary wound healing will be again a problem. So, these are all the drawbacks whichever uh, we get from the uh, allograft, uh, autograft based uh, uh, skin graft.
So, uh, what could be the solution means like we have uh, come across uh, from stone age to now we are in the plastic. So, in the plastic age we are using uh, multiple polymers and uh, we are uh, using polymers, we can uh, use polymers for various uh, good applications like uh, these kind of things. So, we can make some prosthetic uh, implant, that prosthetic implant can be made with the polymer. So, with that polymer can be used as a skin graft, instead of that graft is taken from own patient body, we can use the polymer as a skin graft, because ultimately we are uh, developing the graft just to cover that uh, wound bed. So, once we covered it and that graft is completely biocompatible, the cells will start infiltrating into it and it will try to form the normal structure of the skin. So, uh, <coughs> this is how that will work. So, consider uh, this is this is our uh, skin graft and uh, that skin graft is placed into that uh, wound bed. So, once it is placed and it will be stitched or uh, they will be doing some uh, dressing, then once that dressing is completed, obviously that wound healing will occur and that will form the normal skin. So, uh, global tissue engineering market involves uh, like uh, highest market is based on the skin. So, uh, once we develop that uh, skin graft, so that can be used for two different applications. The first application could be that uh, skin graft can be used for wound healing. As I told uh, the wound whichever cannot be healed at, uh, by own innate mechanism, that type of things need some graft. So, for such kind of applications we can use this uh, skin graft and another uh, type of applications is like for uh, cosmetics related things we are uh, developing so many drug and uh, molecules. So, for checking or screening that drug molecule we are using so much of animals and uh, humans. So, uh, that involves ethical considerations and many problems. If we are able to develop a skin graft equivalent to the normal skin, so that skin graft itself can be used uh, for drug screening applications. Hello everyone, I am Vasudha, an MS student in Dr. Vignesh Muthuvijayan's lab. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, various design strategies that have been used to synthesize tissue engineered skin grafts. Artificial skin is designed in two stages, stage 1 and 2. Stage 1 is applicable to short term acute use, while stage 2 is applicable to long term chronic use. Stage 1 deals with physical and mechanical aspects of the design, while stage 2 deals with biochemical aspects. Uh, in stage 1, uh, the major critical graft properties that are considered include bending rigidity, uh, surface energy uh, which affects the wetting of the graft, moisture flux rate through the graft, uh, tear strength and blood compatibility. Uh, the critical wound bed properties uh, such as viable tissue are of considerable importance and the critical properties at the graft wound interface include wetting and the peel strength and the clinical functions that are most important at this stage are infection and fluid loss control. In the stage 2, the graft properties that are important are biodegradability and uh, non-antigenicity of the membrane is crucial, also uh, porosity of the membrane. Uh, the pore size of the membrane, the thickness and the blood compatibility. So, the desired events in the graft lifetime include migration of non-inflammatory cells uh, such as fibroblast and keratinocytes, a synthesis of neodermal tissue and also the metabolic disposal of the graft. So, in this stage other than the infection and fluid loss control, contracture and scar control are considerably important. So, there are uh, different physico chemical and mechanical aspects uh, that are important for achieving effective wound closure. So, in this uh, representation uh, you can see the formation of air pockets uh, because of ineffective wound closure. Uh, in figure B you can see that uh, due to excessive flexural rigidity of the graft uh, there is formation of air pockets between the uh, at the wound and graft interface. Uh, in figure C, due to excessive shear stresses, there is formation of air pockets. In figure D, that is due to uh, peeling, excessive peeling forces. And in figure E, 
due to uh, excessive moisture flux rate through the graft, there is dehydration of the membrane at the corners, so which causes lifting of the membrane. In figure F, uh, the moisture flux rate is insufficient, due to that there is excessive fluid accumulation which can cause edema. So, all these should be prevented to achieve effective wound closure. So, what is the long range design objective for artificial skin? Uh, it should, uh, you should design a membrane that provides satisfactory wound closure to prevent infection and fluid loss. Uh, the graft or the membrane should be solid, degradable and non-antigenic and also it should provide early opportunity for cell migration and connective tissue synthesis that is collagen deposition uh, inside the membrane or graft. So, the lifetime of the membrane uh, is a very important aspect. So, here T b is the time constant of biodegradation and T l is the time constant for normal uh, healing of the skin incision. So, the T b that is the biodegradation rate has to be optimized, because if the uh, T b is much lesser than T l then there is ineffective wound closure that is the membrane is getting degraded before the healing process takes place. Also, if it is much higher than T L, then it has been observed that there is fibroid tissue formation under the uh, graft. Uh, the next aspect is porosity. Uh, porosity is uh, crucial to allow cellular migration into the graft and also important for the exchange of gases and nutrients. Uh, porosity uh, is also important to allow uh, the cells that participate in wound healing process to migrate into the graft, uh, majorly being mesenchymal and epithelial cells. Uh, these cells have a size of around approximately 10 micrometers. So, uh, the pore size of the membranes should be larger than this to allow cellular migration. Also, a different type of cells invade the initially non-cellular membrane. Uh, this is an image of, this is a scanning electron microscope image uh, of a silk fibroin chitosan blend scaffold. So, you can see the uh, interconnected pores in the image. Cell motility through the graft uh, depends on the availability of gases and nutrients. So, the conditions under which diffusion alone suffices to maintain the supply of nutrients to the cells that are advancing through the graft uh, is estimated using a dimensionless number s. So, in this equation, gamma is the rate of utilization of a critical nutrient by the cell, L is membrane thickness, uh, distance along the membrane thickness uh, along which the cell has to uh, migrate itself. D is the diffusi diffusivity of the nutrient in the membrane. C naught is the nutrient concentration at or near the uh, surface of the wound bed. So, L c is the maximum path length along which cells can migrate without requiring any more nutrient than supplied by diffusion. So, if your membrane thickness L is approximately equal to L c, then the cells can uh, migrate without requiring nutrients uh, other than that supplied by diffusion. However, if the membrane uh, thickness is large, much larger, then what happens is you need an additional uh, mode of nutrient supply. So, then there is need for migration of endothelial cells and vascularization, which is an important aspect in skin tissue engineering. Endothelial cells have a migration rate of around 0.4 millimeters per day and fibroblast cells around 0.2 millimeters per day and this rate is usually insufficient to cover the surface of the graft in a period comparable for wound healing. So, an alternative approach that is used uh, is to culture epithelial cells on the membrane surface at an appropriate time following grafting. So, the uh, materials used for skin tissue engineering have to satisfy certain needs. So, 
major of them include providing a barrier layer of renewable keratinocytes and uh, allow them to securely attach to the underlying dermis, promote vascularization and also provide elastic structural support for the skin. So, um, the biomaterials used for skin tissue engineering can be an epidermal cover uh, which can deliver cultured keratinocytes. So, this is uh, the upper thin layer of the skin. Uh, this usually is involved in prevention of infection and fluid loss or it can also be a replacement of the dermis which is the underlying thicker layer. So, this layer is mostly composed of fibroblasts or it can also be an epidermal and dermal replacement which is usually a split skin graft. Also the in, uh, tissue engineered skin can contain appendage constructs such as hair follicles and sweat glands. Uh, the presence of these helps us mimic the natural skin uh, more closely. Also the uh, pre vascularized constructs can be uh, provided to supply nutrients to the graft. Uh, like we discussed if the thickness of the uh, graft is uh, much higher then diffusion alone is not sufficient to provide gases and nutrients. Uh, in the next lecture uh, we will look at uh, different materials that can be used for skin tissue engineering uh, and we will also look at various fabrication techniques uh, that are used to synthesize uh, tissue engineered skin grafts.